You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 316 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. And I'm joined as always by my co-host. He's my cousin and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? But what they say, Jeremy, uh, these were the best of times and these were the worst of times. And that's how this week kind of feels a little bit to me. Boy, what a week for the Cubs did not play out as we had predicted. Uh, We will have a guest on shortly to come on and help us preview the week that will be as the Cubs have six games coming up against the Pittsburgh Pirates. So we will have someone on to help us preview that series because we are the best pre pre pregame show on the internet. So we will preview that later on in the show at first before we get to the week that will be. We will talk about the week that was for the Cubs Last we podcasted, the Cubs were up two games to one in San Diego. They proceeded to lose and have a split against the Pirates. I'm sorry, against the Padres, who we deemed uh, were surprisingly not as good as we thought they'd be. And then they were off to Anaheim to play a team that we knew they were as bad as we thought they were, the Anaheim Angels. Was not pitching in that series either. No Otani pitching. And we felt good. We felt good about the Cubs' chances going in to, to the uh, Anaheim Stadium there. And phew, just a disappointing series all around. Just uh, let's, let's start with your thoughts on just beyond disappointing for the Cubs. I mean, if you told me at the beginning of the series the Cubs would go four and six, that would not have shocked me. I probably would have said, well, it sounds about right, I suppose. Uh, did I feel like four and six would uh, catapult them into contention? No. <laughs> uh, it kind of keeps them treading water, barely on life support. But it's especially tough when you win the first two games of the 10 games and you feel like, okay, well, if we split the last eight games, it will be six and four. Would that be nice? And then course they lose the four in a row in the middle and they come back and the giants twice and then they drop the third game today leaving them unsworn uns- having not swept anyone since the oakland series back in april and the cubs are now further out of first place than they were a week ago not by much they're six and a half out close to five and a half out but they find themselves a little bit farther out of second place and 10 more or seven more games have gone off the calendar. So it doesn't feel like we've made any ground this week. Nothing has really happened that we would make, make you feel like, okay, well, Cubs are in decent shape. We're 65 games into the season. And uh, it feels like they're one more bad week away from being wiped out, especially against divisional foes. But we'll get to that later, I know. We will. Uh, the The road trip did end on a positive note, uh, taking two of three in San Francisco. I had predicted that they would lose two here in San Francisco, but holy cow, what a pitching performance by Kyle Hendricks taking a no-hitter into the eighth inning, taking a no-hitter further than anyone else has done in Major League Baseball this season. Kyle Hendricks, uh, thanks to an early defensive gem of a catch by Tuckman, but... Uh, the and the offensive uh, firepower that we were hoping to see. We love to see home runs from Mervis and Morell in the same game, helping to give the Cubs a four to nothing victory. Uh, glad to see Hendricks back. This is the Hendricks we we hoped we'd see. We, this was this exceeds all expectations. Yeah, this was circa 2016 Hendricks today. Uh, it's nice. It's really nice to see him do well. Most Cubs fans, I think, who have been watching Kyle Hendricks in Cubs uniform for so many years, pull for him. He's the last sort of vestige of the of the championship season, and uh, somebody who is easy to root for. Seems like a pretty level headed, even keeled, nice guy. He's in the last year of his contract. I hope he has a couple more 
good performances with the Cubs, certainly in June and July. Who knows what will happen at the trade deadline, but after last year and, and how he got knocked around quite a bit before he went on the IL, it is nice to see him perform better this season because I want to keep those positive memories and, and maybe add a couple more like like this week's weekend's game to the list of his accomplishments uh, before we lose him, which whether it's at the trade deadline or at the end of the year seems probably inevitable one way or the other. Yeah, and it's it's great to yeah, see a, a vintage performance from Kyle Hendricks. Looking good since coming back from that injury. Last season was so hard to watch because, like you mentioned, yeah. you root for the guy and you want to see him do well, not just because we're Cubs fans, but because he's a, a great person as well. So you, you want to see him succeed and watching – the struggles of the last season plus uh, has, has been difficult. So when you can see a couple of great starts coming back from uh, from rehabbing an injury, definitely a positive, definitely something to continue to watch as the season progresses. Looking at where the Cubs are after this road trip. <laughs> so uh, the Cubs find themselves 28-37 and 37 as of the time of this recording. Their run differential, which we've been watching all season, minus thirteen, and that's with that better Oakland when it was series. Plus sixty four, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's with that Oakland series in there. Yeah. So definitely a uh, <laughs> the the Pittsburgh Pirates are are atop the division with a plus two run differential, okay. the only positive run differential in the NL Central. Uh, we will. What an awful division. <laughs> we will dive deeper into that with our guest. A little bit later, but looking at this Cubs team, we just see the the one roster move this week as uh, Master Boney goes down to AAA. Nick Madrigal returns to the team. Uh, had to suffer through him playing third base again. Uh, it, routine plays look like such a struggle when he's playing third base. Uh, I I just don't see where this team gets anymore. They're all here, right? Everybody who you think could make a difference is here. And this is the team. Is the team good enough? Or is it good enough to add to? Or do you have to tear it down again at the trade deadline? That's the big question. I've seen Hayden Wiseski come back and pitch a couple games since returning from the minors, making all the necessary adjustments to thrive at the major league level. Unfortunately, he has not performed any better than he did before he got hurt. In fact, maybe even worse before he got sent back. So, again, somebody who was lights out in spring training and who was this dominant arm that people were very excited about, circa Caleb Gilliam from last year and others, uh, comes to everything to show for it. Bottom line. It's, you know, I think I noted on Twitter. You can uh, get rid of all your star players, and you might have good reason to do so. But you got to replace them with like talent. Cubs have not done that, so they are replace them with like talent or better. You can improve yeah. too. You're or allowed better. to do that. Yeah. And you know the the emphasis was going to be rely on the farm system, and so far it's just not getting here. Or what it does, it, it, it's not doing as well as it helps. That's a great uh, that's a great segue to looking at the other news of the week, which was Marcus Stroman and his comment. We talked last week. We had uh, Kevin McCaffrey on the podcast last week. We were talking about how what a great season Marcus Stroman is having. What a delight it is to have him on this Cubs team, and we think we'd like to see the Cubs re-sign him as he has an option he can opt out of of his contract after this year uh, we'd like yeah. to see that. i'd like to pay him the 20 so he's due 21 million next year that seems unlikely that he would ex- pick up that option so the cubs choices are multifold i guess one you could trade him at the deadline this year which has been banded about by some already second thing you do is you could pay him the money you think he's worked into a contract extension or third, you could hold on to him for a fake playoff run and then 
at the end of that, just let them walk, which sounds as if the Cubs would do, but I don't think that's a wise option. I guess my concern is if you let Stroman go, again, it gets back to the idea before of who do you replace him with? It's not enough just to say, well, he wasn't worth a four year deal because he's you know, 32 or whatever it is. That's not enough reason to not sign him if you don't, because if, if all your other options are more expensive, older pitchers, then, you know, what are you really telling us here? And we've seen time after time, Cubs let people go and then bring in new people who are worse, <laughs> talent wise, and, you know, just aren't in any other way in, in, and, and in many cases, it's good to pay them a decent amount. So I don't understand that philosophy, but. But here we are. So Strowman wants to come back to the Cubs, he says. He said that he and his agent have reached out, and the Cubs have not been interested in negotiating a contract extension. I think that's a mistake. I think they should. But we'll see. Yeah, I, this his tweet came uh his tweet came kind of out of nowhere. It just said uh my right agent, our podcast. and and that's what it led me to believe that he was listening to us talk on the podcast last week, and he had to send out a tweet about this. So, Marcus Stroman, I assume you're 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 listening again. Thank you for uh, uh, for for listening to the show and uh, reaching out. We were this was huge news, and we were glad to get an update on it because yeah, we want to see Marcus Stroman resign, and he tweeted out. Quote, my agent and I made multiple attempts to engage them on an extension. Club wasn't interested in exploring it now. We'll see how it plays out. Love everything about the Cubs organization. Uh, there was an article in The Athletic that followed up on this with some additional questions. And it was the same line of answers that uh, they've, they would like to discuss a contract. The Cubs have not put anything forward. This is yeah, that's bad. This is it. It's f- it's fine, I guess. If your go- if if your plan is like it, if you had the goodwill that we that like you mentioned, we knew that you were either going to put out a deal or you were going to make a trade that makes you better and not a trade that makes you better four years from now, but are you in a window now? Are you trying to start a window now? If so, if you want to be competitive next year, Marcus Stroman on your team helps make you competitive next year, not four years from now. If you trade him at best, you get a guy, maybe a minor leaker, who you anticipate coming up sometime next year. Uh, we've seen what rookie pitchers have done in the past with the Cubs. It's it's not an easy thing to do, an easy position. And you put yourself back a couple more years, and at some point you're probably wondering, well, then why do we get the Anthony Swanson if we're not going to try to compete? So it is a slippery slope. I think they've reached the point where you need to stop trading people just because they're good. If they're good, resign them and trade the peripheral pieces that you might get more for than, than they are probably worth in value. Right, and, and you'd, you'd be lucky to get a prospect that might pitch a year later because teams understand the leverage you do not have in, if you are having to trade a player who has the ability to opt out of their contract. So uh, the, this is – and play, teams aren't just giving away prospects like they used to anymore. It's not, it's not that type of a league. So uh, The kids are at the forefront of that. I, I'd like to give them credit for that thing. They uh, decided when they traded you Darvish that they would begin that trend of not getting much back in return. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think they deserve they deserve uh, credit where credit is due. We will do that podcast uh, where we revisit this rebuild in uh, a little more detail as uh, as the season progresses here, especially if the wheels continue to fall off of uh, of this season here. But there's still time. There's still time for the Cubs to be good. There's still time for the Cubs to sign Marcus Stroman, but they've got to do something. Uh, currently, it's uh, just a lot of uh, hoping that guys turn it around, but there's not a lot of... It's not like 
a lot of guys aren't already having career years and <laughs> they're not already yeah. doing a great job. <laughs> Certainly on the pitching side, I think hitting wise, positional player wise, there's a lot of improvement yet to be made. Uh, I see, you know, over the last couple of weeks, Stansby Swanson has slumped considerably offensively and Horner has certainly slumped offensively. Uh, Wisdom had a really rough stretch. Ian Happ has been slumping. You know, there's, there's a lot of guys now, there are a lot of guys now who, who are really hopefully headed for a rebound. But what I will say this is this, uh, in the last two months now, the last two months, any time the Cubs have given up more than two runs to their opponents, they have lost, except for once. They're 1-30 and 30 when they give up more than two runs. So when we talked about that Marcus Stroman complete game or the Hendricks near no hitter or – few of the, these other games, that's great. But just know that when the Cubs give up more than two runs, they lose. 30 out of the last 31. That's that's a sign of A, they don't score enough runs, and B, despite having good pitching, what can you do, really? Uh, because obviously your uh, your offense isn't there to protect you. That's, that's an incredible stat when you think about it. It's a... Uh... Two runs I mean, or more is insurmountable. In th- you can't win a game four to three or five to three, right? Not not last two months, just once. Um, that's rough because you're asking your pitchers to be perfect. You're asking your starters to be perfect, and you're asking a lot of your bullpen. And the bullpen has been fairly mediocre to bad the last several weeks. But keep in mind that as bad as they've been, it's only exacerbated when you yourself don't score enough runs to be competitive and knowing that you've given up three runs means you've lost the game. That is a lot of pressure in their bullpen as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It's just, uh, it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to see how the turnaround happens here. Um, it, and it feels like there's, you know, I, I hope that there's a feeling of a sense of urgency because, uh, we're, it, it's not like, it's not like we're seeing lineups that are trying to shake things up or do something. We're seeing lineups where like Suzuki's not playing again and I'm scratching my yeah. head. Where is he for two straight days now? Right. He should be your fourth best hitter in the lineup. Instead, he's your first or second in most days. And then other days, he's not even in the lineup. So you don't even have that. <laughs> which is problematic. Uh, I just see the, the Cubs lineup, both their their offensive lineup and also their, their pitching as being flawed in that they, they just don't have enough pieces. So no matter how close to first base it seems like they are, uh, it does feel a little bit like fool's gold. And then when you take into consideration the fact that Justin Steele's on the 15-day injured list, do we have any real expectation that we'll see him before the All-Star break? I don't. No, I mean, it's it's one of those that's so terrifying. It could be nothing he's back or, oh, no, no, it's Tommy John, and we'll see him next year. Like, it's really yeah. scary right now. He's got, you know, that's a month from now. Uh, and, you know, that's a huge loss. It's a huge loss even for three starts. It's a really huge loss for, for longer. And, and I do think it'll be, you know, if not, if not terrible news, I do think we're looking at probably him missing five starts and by the time it gets back, we'll see where the Cubs are, but you know, we need Kyle Hendricks to keep pitching well because Wisniewski is really struggling and, and the Cubs just without steel don't have the depth in their lineup in their uh, rotation. And then on top of that, you've got the Cody Bellinger situation and it's reported that he is near being ready to have a rehab assignment. So I give that about a 10 day, window before you'll see him again right realistically that's that's some good news uh that you, you <laughs> I will see him again yeah <laughs> let's, let's hope that it, it matters when we do i mean you know the cubs did tread water a little bit with the four and six road trip but you need to also continue to tread water and maybe even be slightly above 500 the next couple weeks while they're both out of the lineup because otherwise it does get less practical to think that you you put it all together and, and have a comeback and, and be successful. Yeah, and the 
the schedule for the rest of this month is going to be incredibly important to making those decisions as we uh, finish out June and turn the calendar to July because uh, this is it. They play half their season's games against the Pirates in the next week. They also will play two against St. Louis in London. We'll have, uh, we'll have Anthony Wooten on next week to help us preview the London series from London. And after that, you've got four against the Brewers before the All-Star break. So you're going to play a ton of division games here. You will know going into the All-Star break where you stand uh, after playing the majority of the games against your, your division rivals already. Uh, in addition to the division rivals that you point out, they also have three games at New York, playing the Yankees, three games against Philadelphia, and three games against the Orioles, all of whom have had various levels of, of success and or would certainly be favored against the Cubs probably in the short series. So it's going to be, uh, again, this is a time when, when the Cubs have to at least play 500, but ideally a little bit above 500 just to start clawing back. And at the same time, you know, let it, getting some more days off the calendar before Steele and Bellinger come back. If they come back, which I assume they will. Yeah. You don't want to lose. You want to get swept by Pittsburgh in one of these series or lose four out of six to Pittsburgh because that just puts you further behind and there just aren't a lot of other games against Pittsburgh to make those up. You want to play them six more times after this. Yeah. Really, really interesting stretch of the season here. Uh, we keep saying it's early, it's early, it's early, but boy, it's going to be. You know, you're a couple of weeks away here from the All Star break, and so it's a uh, a lot of decisions will be made coming out of that. Uh, Sixteen games away from being at the halfway mark of the schedule. So it's uh yeah, whew. so we'll we'll see. It's it's a tough road ahead. Th- this is why you were hoping that the Cubs were going to be able to bank some wins against some bad teams. <laughs> yeah, I gave up on that after that failed to happen. Uh, but you're right. That would have been nice. It would have been nice to do better against uh, the Marlins and the Nationals and other teams, but and the Angels and the Angels. But that's that's you know behind us, I guess, at this point. Um, so about point. But well, let's let's look ahead. And looking ahead, we mentioned six games against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And let's bring on our guest to help us preview the upcoming series. Joining us on the line, you know him from his work at Pittsburgh Baseball Now. It's his first appearance on our podcast to help us with learn about all things Pittsburgh Pirates today. John Parado, thanks for uh, jumping on and, and talking Pirates on a Cubs podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, I think the thing we want to start out at right at the top is are the pirates actually good (laughs) because they are currently at first place in this division at the time of this recording they're the only team like we mentioned earlier in the podcast they're the only team with a positive run differential in this uh nl central division uh it's been a while is the are the pittsburgh pirates actually uh, a, a competitive team at a first place level in this division? I think certainly in the National League Central, which is, you know, obviously not very strong this year and no really, really good teams in the division. So, yeah, I, I think where they are in the standings based off where they've played to this point is no fluke. Now, whether they can carry this over for the next 90 some games and win the division, I don't know yet. And I think if you put this team in the National League East or the National League West, they wouldn't really have a chance to win the division. But in this division where nobody is taking control and and nobody looks like a powerhouse, certainly the Brewers are are decent, but they're not uh, overpowering. The Cardinals have have been a massive disappointment. And the Cubs and the Reds are, I mean, they're okay, but they're they're certainly not a team that looks like either one would win 90 or 95 games. So 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, they're, they're not great. They're not world beaters. I certainly wouldn't say they're among the top five teams in the game. But I do think they were definitely uh, an improved club, a very improved club after losing 101 in 100 games the last two years and, and finishing last in the National League Central for the last four years. So, yeah, I think if they can stay around 500 or a few games over, they probably can contend in the, into late in the season in, in the National League Central. Yeah, you know, the Cubs had, we as Cubs fans had anticipated, especially after the hot start that Pittsburgh got off to, they were blazing hot to start the year. And that made us nervous a little bit. We were surprised that they were so good. They were, I think, 20 and 8 at one point. And then they lost 11 out of 12. And we're like, oh, okay, well, it's the Pirates. Everything's back to normal. It'll be fine. Uh, but lo and behold, they they have they didn't just give up. They, they kind of pushed back and and now they're on a little bit of a run here. They've won, what, 7 out of 10. Uh, so it's hard to dismiss them, especially when they're starting to do things differently than we would anticipate. We were thinking, well, the Pirates will be looking to trade uh, 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 Brian Reynolds at this point, you know, or, or soon soon after June, like early July, because that's what they do. And, uh, and here, lo and behold, they signed him to an extension. So that was kind of a, a surprising change of pace. And, and and they've done a lot of this without O'Neill Cruz, who's their you know I guess I would say bright young shortstop prospect who you know has a lot of potential, uh, and they've managed to like you say in, in what's not maybe the greatest division in baseball, uh, in fact probably one of the worst. They've managed to not just hold their own, but kind of take control here a little bit. And you look at some of the other guys' pieces they have. We all knew they they're. Uh, that, that Bernard guy was a decent closer. We just never thought that he'd have a bunch of games to close. Well, lo and behold, here he is. Uh, he's, you know, he's had some games that he's been able to close for them. Uh, you know, Mitch Keller, guys like that. We just never really thought that the Pirates were going to be close enough where any of that would matter. And yet, uh, now it looks like we were wrong, and and they may have what it takes to certainly against the Brewers and and whoever else is left in this division after the next couple of weeks. They may have what it takes to uh, to make it through the rest of the season. You know, they may. And, uh, you know, it really goes back to the off season when, when the Pirates uh, actually made an effort to try to put a more representative team on the field after really the last couple of years, uh, especially the last two uh, where they were rebuilding or tanking or whatever you want to call it. I mean, they, they had a lot of players in the lineup in the rotation in the bullpen that really weren't legitimate big league players and wouldn't be able to play for pretty much any other team in, in the majors. But they went out this winter and they got some legitimate big league guys that the people have heard of and have track records. Uh, chief among them bringing Andrew McCutcheon back five years after they traded him to San Francisco for, ironically enough, Brian Reynolds. And also uh, Carlos Santana, to play first base, uh, they they signed Rich Hill uh, to you know be at the back end of the rotation, and he's done well. And they signed Austin Hedges to catch, and and Hedges hasn't hit, but of course he really hasn't hit for three or four years now. But what he does do is handle pitchers well, and he is good defensively. He's a good framer. He's a good pitch blocker, so he gives them really good defense behind the plate, which at least makes up partially for his offensive deficiencies. So I think, you know, but I, I think what I noticed when, when I got to spring training there the first day and I was there for the first week of camp was a whole different attitude. It was like you just had that feeling in their clubhouse like, hey, we have some real guys now and we might actually be able to win a few games. Now, I, I don't think anybody – realistically when spring training started would say hey the pirates uh you know the first sunday of june at the end of the play on the first sunday of june or, or four games over 500 in first place i i don't think even the most optimistic person uh, in, in the fan base or in, in that clubhouse or front office would have thought that but, but certainly you could see and you could feel when you talk to guys uh, that there was optimism there and, and they thought they were going to be better. And, and they so far, and again, you know, you still have almost two thirds of the season to go. They've uh, exceeded uh, everyone's expectations. What was the catalyst for the, the front office to go out and sign some of these guys and, and try to field a more competitive team? Well, I think for one, I, I think, 
you know, the lack of attention. I think part of it was business sense <laughs> in, in a way, which, uh, you know, they, they didn't draw very many people the last two years. And uh, I think they felt they had to do something to get more people in the stands to generate some interest. Uh, you know, the owner, Bob Nutting here, has been much maligned. And, and, and certainly re- there are reasons why he's been much maligned, because he hasn't spent much money the last few years. And he put a terrible team on the field. And I just wonder, and, you know, he doesn't make himself available to the media all that often. And when he does, he just gives canned the cliche answers. So you never really get to get into his mind to see what he's really thinking. But people I know in the front office and in ownership circles say he got tired of losing and he got tired of all the criticism he took in the media and from the fans. And he decided to do something about it. And you know, and they went out and, and decided to get some players. And uh, lo and behold, uh, they're in first place. They're drawing well. They had 35,000 on Saturday when the Mets were here for a 4 o'clock game. Uh, their attendance is, is up uh, substantially over the last couple of seasons. So, uh, you know, I think part of it's the bottom line, and part of it is just the eventually personal pride get, kicks in and you get tired of getting your butts kicked every day. And the other advantage <laughs> that the Pirates seem to have is um... – they have the first overall pick in the draft coming up, don't they? And, they do, yes. And their farm system is is on the upswing. You know, we as Cubs fans have been told that um, one of the benefits of trading away all of our beloved players from the World Series team was that we would build a juggernaut of a farm system. We haven't quite seen the, the fruits of that yet because everybody who's made it up to majors is, has struggled, but... I see the the Pirates have had some guys, not only like as we mentioned earlier, O'Neill Cruz, but but getting the first round pick again and having other guys, you know, apparently getting close to, to coming up, they might actually be able to build something for a for a market that maybe not isn't gonna spend two hundred million on a payroll. They certainly have some guys they can bring up in the next year or so that it looks like their future might be brighter than uh, than even it is now. You know, I I think it's going to be, uh, but, you know, as somebody who's covered the Pirates for 36 years and seen a lot of rebuildings and a lot of, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of five-year plans that didn't work out except for the mid-2010s when they got to the wild card game three years in a row. I mean, they, they went 20 years without a winning season from 1993 to 2012, which is the longest stretch for any franchise in any of the major four pro sports in North America. So <laughs> it's not as, you know, it always sounds good. And the Cubs did it once. I mean, and it paid off for them with the World Series. But now the second rebuilding after the World Series hasn't paid off. And the Pirates are certainly have been in that position before. But I do think uh, this time they've hit on some trades uh, and, and, and gotten some decent players, and I think they've drafted better. And in the past, uh, you know, they've had a lot of high draft picks over the years that just didn't pan out. I'm talking like top 10 picks, top five picks. They seem to do a better job. This time they drafted Henry Davis, number one overall, two years ago, the catcher from Louisville, and he just moved up from double A to triple A, and I, I'm sure we'll see him here in Pittsburgh at some point between now and the end of the season. And and they do have, uh, you know, some young guys. You mentioned O'Neill Cruz, who's uh, not, you know, technically not a prospect now. He's been in the big leagues for almost, uh, you know, a full year between the previous two seasons and broke his ankle. If he comes back from the broken ankle, and uh, they're hopeful that he comes back, uh, you know, pretty much the same player he was before he got hurt. He's certainly a centerpiece player, a, a 24-year-old shortstop with power and speed and a, and a strong arm. And he's uh, huge too. Yeah, and he's a large man. He's six foot six, uh, six foot seven, I should say. Yeah. And uh, you know, he when when he comes out of the shower, he has his he has cornrows and he, uh, or I should say, dreadlocks, and he. Uh, puts him up high up in the air when he goes and takes a shower and washes his hair. So he's about seven foot two when you see him when he has his <laughs> dreadlocks all the way up into the sky. But yeah, he's, I mean, they have some good players. They have some good young players. They have more coming, uh, you know, whether they pan out or not, who knows, uh, you know, they, they, you know, the, the opposing scouts and the people who rank these prospects like baseball, America, MLB pipeline, baseball prospectus, fan graphs, 
they seem to like a lot of the Pirates' young players. So I, I would think uh, they should get a difference maker at number one this year, and all signs are that they're going to draft Dylan Cruz, the uh, outfielder from LSU, with the, with the number one pick. So they uh, they have the nucleus of a pretty good team, and they should be adding to that here with some guys, including Quinn Priester, who's from the Chicago area, was their number one draft pick as a high school player in 2019. Uh, he's a tripway, and he's pitched real well lately. So he's only 22, and he's on the cusp of the major leagues. So, yeah, things are looking up here. But uh, as, as someone who's seen a, a lot of other rebuilds fail, I want to see a little bit more before I totally jump on the bandwagon. You also stole one of the Cubs uh, prospects who they drafted back in 2002, uh, just 21 years ago, uh, be, that being Rich Hill. <laughs> yeah. who, who's your number two starter? He's a, he's a good-looking young pitcher for yeah. sure. <laughs> Jeremy and I saw him pitch for the Cubs 16 years ago and yeah. uh, enjoyed him, you know, and uh, helped the Cubs get to the playoffs that year. And if you had told me at the time that 16 years later he'd be – Helping another NL Central team, I, I would have thought that would be in maybe a coaching or managerial yeah. capacity. But here we are. You know, it's been a remarkable story, and I mean, he has been for a while now, even before he came here to Pittsburgh. But you know, he, he's pitched on the whole well. He's had a few clunker starts, but he's also had a couple of really, really dominant type starts. Uh, he's forty three. He's in great shape. He still loves the game. He. He's been great for their young pitchers. They just gravitate to him for his knowledge and his preparation and how he goes about his business. And, uh, you know, it was funny the other day, he threw 119 pitches Friday night here against the Mets. And that was the most pitches thrown by a pitcher 40 or older since Tim Wakefield in 2011. So I, 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 I mean, and, and Hill's throwing actual pitches. Too, yeah. Yeah. They were, yeah. <laughs> so being the intrepid reporter that I am, I, I asked Rich after the game, if he thought, you know, being like Wakefield, he could eventually be a knuckleballer and maybe pitch until he's 58 in the big <laughs> leagues. And he wouldn't rule it out, but he said he'd need a lot of anti-inflammatories to do that. <laughs> so, so yeah, looking at uh, at the team now, you mentioned the uh, kind of the clubhouse vibe going into spring training in that first week of camp. Uh, uh, how is it now? Uh, I'm sure things got nervous uh, with that Oakland series, and uh, how, how are things now as as the Cubs are are as they're heading into town to to play the Cubs? Uh, is this team flying high right now after this Met series? Yeah, I would say so. Uh... You know, they, they started 20 and 8, and uh, certainly everyone knew they weren't going to keep playing at that clip all season. But then they went 6 and 19 after the 20 and 8, and, and certainly the fan base here and, and the writers like myself thought, well, let's see, maybe the bubble was burst, and that was just a mirage, the 20 and 8 start. But they've righted the ship, and now they're four games over 500 again. And you know, uh, they, they've showed me something with that, with the resiliency, because uh, I, I really thought there when they were struggling that maybe it was just a one month blip and, and they really just weren't very good. And they just played over their heads for 28 games, but they've bounced back. And like you said, they took two or three from the Mets. They had an ugly series here with Oakland at the beginning of the week, lost two out of three and really should have been swept. The A's gave away the first game of that series, or it should have been. As they were prone to do. Yeah, they yes. tried to give them all <laughs> away. Yeah. <laughs> well, they got healthy here. They won two, and then they swept three in Milwaukee, so maybe yeah. they found the magic potion here in Pittsburgh somehow. Oh, the NL Central. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But but getting back, yeah, I, I've, I've been impressed. And, and, you know, and even when they were losing – you didn't have that sense when you talked to players that they were as down as the fans were. You still had the sense that they thought, hey, we're still pretty good. That 20-8 and eight stretch wasn't just uh, blind luck. We're a pretty good team. And lo and behold, they, they've, uh, like I said, you know, they've, they've studied themselves and, you know, they've climbed back up to first place. And, again, it's just 34-30, and 30, so it's, it's nothing to get that excited about. But when you've lost 101 and 101, 100 games each of the last two seasons, 34 and 30 looks pretty darn good. Looking, uh, looking ahead to the pitching matchup, we only have one pitching matchup announced for the next series, and that's the opener with Jamison Tyone for the Cubs and uh, Ortiz for the Pirates. Uh, 
Well, tell us a little bit about Ortiz's season so far. Yeah, Luis Ortiz, uh, he uh, really wasn't much of a prospect. Uh, he had signed him out of the Dominican for only a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, he was okay his first few years in, in the minors, and he kind of blew up last year. And uh, in A ball and double A, he ended up pitching, making four starts for the Pirates uh, at the end of last season in September. And uh, he's a big guy, about 6'3, 240, and uh, very, you know, very uh, big, big guy. And he had two pretty good starts and two pretty bad starts in his four starts. Began the year back at AAA this year, which was probably the right thing to do. He kind of showed at the end of the last season he wasn't quite ready to be a regular in, in a big league rotation. Uh, started six games in AAA and, and did quite well. He was 4-1. and one. ERA was, uh, I believe, 2.23, if my memory serves me right. Got caught up again when they had an injury, and uh, he has pitched – Okay. In fact, better than okay. He, he's gotten better every time out. He had a couple of rough starts to begin with, uh, but he's pitched better. And, uh, you know, he's a good looking young guy and, and somebody that, you know, I could foresee being part of this rotation for, you know, the next few years moving forward. And, uh, you know, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's got the stuff and uh, he really had a, like I said, he, he kind of came out of nowhere as a prospect to, to come from like a, just a, another guy to being a top 100 prospect by the end of last season. And uh, so there's certainly upside there for a, uh, for a guy who's only 24 years old. And the Cubs have been looking for one of these guys who just comes out of nowhere and actually succeeds at the MLB level. We're still waiting, uh, which, which brings me to the question that I am most curious about, which is, as a sort of a, a Cubs outsider, as somebody who doesn't necessarily follow the Cubs on a day to day basis, or, or, or even probably, um, you know, necessarily root for the Cubs as a, as a homer, uh, what is your take on, like, how would you assess the Cubs right now as, as an organization and, and in terms of, you know, their, their near time future here? Like, what do you, what do you perceive their, their status as? I've kind of had the feeling for the last few years since they, they, you know, got rid of most of their core players left from the world series winning team in 16, that they're kind of caught in the middle. They're, they're, they're trying to contend. They went out and signed guys to big money like Marcus Stroman and Dansby Swanson making the kind of moves the contending teams make. But in my estimation, they're not good enough to contend but yet they don't want to rip it all the way down and go with young guys. And I think part of that, as you mentioned earlier, they don't have a whole lot in their farm system. And they're really kind of caught in purgatory right now. They're not good enough to win at the big league level, and they're not good enough to really rebuild like they were at the time when they built the World Series winning team 10, 12 years ago when they tore it down to the studs. And that's a bad spot to be in when you're not good and you're not bad and you're right in the middle. And, you know, I just I don't know. What, what uh, they're, they're from the outside looking in, and I, and I haven't seen the Cubs. I haven't had a chance to be around anybody with the team. Uh, they come into town uh, not this uh, a week from now, and uh, I'm kind of curious to get some people's takes and around the team every day uh, what they think. But but again, purely from an outside looking in standpoint, this year. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. I, I don't know if they're trying to win now, if they're trying to rebuild, or exactly what they're trying to do. That makes all of us. <laughs> we're we're all trying to figure that out together. Yeah. <laughs> um, how is the team on the road versus at home? Is this a team that is uh, kind of playing steady wherever, or are they mostly a home team that's uh, uh, that that has its moments on the road? Uh, they've been okay on the road. They've uh, you know they they swept Boston early in the year. Uh, they, uh, you know, they they took two of three. Or, uh, I'm trying to think here, there was somebody else they beat. And it's like my mind's going blank. But they swept somebody else on the road that was decent. But overall, uh, I mean, they're they're almost identical. The records they're eighteen and sixteen at PNC Park and sixteen and fourteen on the road. And they're they're the only team in in the NL Central with a winning record on the road. So they've, uh, they've more than held their own, uh, away from home. And, and again, that's another sign of a, a team on the rise because, uh, they're still relatively young, despite the, uh, veterans that we've talked about them adding. And, uh, they don't seem phased by going on the road, uh, 
you know, they, they've uh, certainly more than held their own at 16 and 14. Yeah, it is frustrating as Cubs fans to look at the roster construction of Pittsburgh and to think, as you pointed out, the Cubs have been able to go out and get a couple of free agents who are excellent players, but just how little else there was on the roster. You know, when they, when they traded away their core players, they traded away for prospects. You often need very young prospects who we haven't seen at the MLB level yet. So they've had to go out more or less on the free agent market to get any talent they have. And, uh, and it, it, it's hard to build a team solely through free agency. And the Cubs have been in that weird position of having to do that. And they have amazingly for their payroll, uh, quite a few players who aren't particularly good uh, or who are just, you know, very, very middling. And uh, when I see how well the Pirates have done with what they've spent and what they have, it, it is frustrating as a Cubs fan to think maybe, maybe our management slash, um, you know, uh, general management uh, is not necessarily up to up to snuff. What's your take on on your uh, manager, general manager situation with the, with the Pirates right now? Well, you know, uh, Ben Charrington's his fourth year here, and uh, he didn't get hired. The, the Pirates bungled the firing of Neil Huntington as the last yes. general manager. They didn't fire him until like the end of October, over a month after the 2019 season ended, which made no sense at all. So that they I guess they wanted, to get a, whole... they wanted to get a late start on the offseason. Yeah, and after he after he'd interviewed six candidates for the manager's job, and the Pirates had to call all six back and go, "Well, those interviews you came in for the Pittsburgh for, well, they're, they're really null and void now because we <laughs> fired our general manager." So I mean, they really, really bungled it. And then, you know, and it's again a reflection on the owner Bob Nutting, who really knows about as much about baseball as uh, you could put into a thimble. How much he knows about the game. Uh, and how it works. So they got a very late start on the, the general manager and the manager searches after the uh, 2019 season. They were lucky enough to get Ben Charrington, who had won a World Series in Boston, was a, in front office in Boston for a long time. He, he got fired in 2017, and, and Dave Dombrowski replaced him, and Ben was working in the Blue Jays' front office, and he really had turned down the a number of teams that wanted to interview him for the GM job. And he thought Pittsburgh was a great challenge. And now he hasn't said this publicly to reporters, but people I know in the game who've known Ben longer than I have say that it always was kind of his, his passion to want to build a team from scratch, like he's trying to do in Pittsburgh, because when they won in Boston, you know, when you win in a big market, it's easy for people to say, well, you had a lot of money, you had a big payroll, you should have won. And he looked at this as the ultimate challenge to come somewhere where you have one of the lowest payrolls in the game, one of the lowest TV contracts, where you have an owner that doesn't like to spend money. And, and gosh darn it, I, I can still build a good team even with, with not having nearly the advantages I, I had in Boston. And, and that's how he's taken it. And he, he had to tear things down to the ground. And it took a couple of years. And they've lost a lot of games. And, you know, him and Derek Shelton, the manager, really stayed upbeat throughout these first three seasons together. And now the vision they had, which the times to people outside the organization, even myself as somebody that covers the team, wondering, well, is this vision they have really going to come to fruition or is it a pipe dream? And now you see it starting to come to fruition this year. And, uh, you know, I'll give a lot of credit to Ben Charrington because, I mean, he, he inherited an organization that not only was bereft of a lot of talent at the big league level, but also in the farm system. So he had to do the best he could with the trade chips he had to maximize the return. He couldn't those trades. He's had to hit on as many high draft picks as possible. And, you know, nobody's ever perfect. Nobody ever makes, uh, you know, no GM, every, every trade doesn't work out. And every draft pick doesn't work out. But so far, a pretty good percentage of the moves he's made here in the three and a half, four years that he's been in Pittsburgh – have worked out, and now they have, uh, you know, the makings of a uh, team that's, uh, you know, in first place now and, and certainly looks like the type of team if some things fall into place could be competitive here for, uh, you know, for, for a little bit of a run, maybe three, four, five years. Last question from me, John. Really appreciate you uh, coming on. Um, 
Will we see Priester get a shot as uh, a spot starter during this uh, stretch? No, not in Chicago, and I'm sure Quinn was hoping so uh, when there was a rotation opening, being a you know a kid from the Chicago land area. But uh, you know he had a rough start in AAA, but he's pitched really, really well here for the last month and a half. And I think at some point this season he'll get called up. It, it, all appearances are they haven't said anything yet, but it looks like they're going to call kind of a journeyman, a 27 year old right hander in AAA. Triple A uh, named Osvaldo Beto will probably make his debut either Wednesday or Thursday, start one of those games against the Cubs at Wrigley. But definitely Quinn Priester on the way, and I think before this season's over, he'll make his major league debut. And and I they think, and from a little bit I've seen of him in spring training in the minor leagues, think he has a chance to definitely be part of the part of the rotation for a number of years uh, moving forward here in future seasons. Uh, I just want to thank you uh, and the Pirates for Aramis Ramirez and Kenny Lofton back in 2003. <laughs> Kenny Lofton uh, hugged me the night he got traded, by the way. Did he? It's the only yeah. time a player ever hugged me when he got traded. He was so happy. I happened to be just standing there, so he hugged me. He was amazing with the Cubs that yeah. year. It was a magical second half. Obviously, Ramirez stuck around for another seven or eight years after that and uh, really helped kind of build the Cubs uh, for for the rest of that decade, if you could maybe since it's been a while since that, it's been almost twenty years about twenty years now, mm, if you yeah. wouldn't mind doing that again, we could really use it. <laughs> like I said, well, we have a talent deficit that we need to replenish. There was financial reasons for that, and they were in a uh, they were in bad shape financially at the time, and they they had to dump a big contract and like right away because they were to the point where they were almost to the point they weren't going to make payroll in the next pay period. That's how bad the finances were here. They wanted to trade, if you remember, Chris Benson, a right-handed pitcher who was the uh, number one draft pick in 96, uh, the overall number one from Clemson. He got hurt. So the one guy they had that was making a decent amount of money that people would want was a Ramos Ramirez and, and they traded him to the Cubs and uh, really, didn't get anything in return. Uh, Bobby, Hill? Hope Bobby Hill would Bobby. be the answer at third, but Bobby, despite being the most profane man I've ever been around in my life, wasn't a very good player. But boy, he could drop f bombs like anybody I ever met. Uh, John Parado, this has been great. Uh, very helpful for us uh, getting educated on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Please let our listeners know where they can find your work on the internet and follow you on Twitter. Yes, uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of Pittsburgh Baseball now, and, and obviously m most of my work there pertains to, to Pittsburgh and the Pirates. Also, I, I write for Forbes.com, do a, a number of national pieces at Forbes.com, and my Twitter is jperrotto, P-E-R-R-O-T-T-O. And uh, if you follow along, I'll, I'll have plenty of inane trivia for you and a, a lot of inside jokes that nobody gets, including myself. <laughs> well, excellent. Yeah, and we will definitely uh, hopefully have you back uh, to talk uh, more national stuff and, uh, and, and the MLB scene later on this year. That'd be great. Okay, sounds good, guys. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at Wrigleyville Nat. Same for Instagram. I've got right there at the top of the, the, the Twitter. You can also go to our website, WrigleyvilleNation.com. Right at the top there, store. There's a link to store. Father's Day right around the corner. Uh, you want to get a good gift, you can support the podcast by buying some Wrigleyville Nation merchandise. There's a sale going on at the Tee Public Shop right now. You can get t-shirts you go out there you pick the, the design we've got two or three to choose from you can see what they look like uh they're pinned to the top of our our twitter profile there um you we've got a couple designs to choose from you choose your t-shirt color and uh and you get yourself a, a great wrigleyville nation shirt the quality is fantastic and uh, i posted a picture i was drinking coffee the other morning out of my wrigleyville nation mug another uh thing there's a whole bunch of great stuff you can get at at the t public shop it's an easy way to support the show as well as get yourself a gift for father's day and i mentioned Twitter, I mentioned Instagram, Facebook.com slash Wrigleyville Nation as well. Uh, all of the places you can support the show, it's by telling Cub fans about the show. Show them how to subscribe to the podcast. That's a free way to help us. 
Uh, we also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation. That's where our patrons there continue to keep this show ad-free because they support us there. Every single penny goes right back into the show. We appreciate everyone over at the Patreon there. And with that, we are going to wrap it up. We're going to call it a podcast. Pat, thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.